I would like to express my gratitude to the Japanese Society for AIDS Research for inviting me to speak to your annual conference. I'm excited about speaking about fast track cities and how Japan might engage within this network of global cities and municipalities that have signed the Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. My name is Jose Zuniga. I'm president and CEO of the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, as well as the Fast Track Cities Institute. The Fast Track Cities initiative was launched on World AIDS Day 2014 in the city of Paris with 26 original signatories of the Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities. Since then, more than 300 cities and municipalities around the world have joined the network in every region of the world. And in some countries, we have a critical mass of Fast Track Cities, including Brazil, France, Ireland, Portugal, South Africa, and the United States, as well as the United Kingdom. It is our contention that in countries where we have a critical mass of fast-track cities, we can have an impact on national HIV epidemics, ending them sooner than the Sustainable Development Goal 3.3 of ending HIV epidemics by 2030. UNAIDS 909090 and Zero Stigma targets are the starting point for the commitment made by cities and municipalities to end their urban HIV epidemics. But I stress starting point because ultimately our goal is to get to zero new HIV infections zero AIDS-related deaths, and zero stigma. Fast Track Cities are a global network of cities that are committed to ending HIV, but also ending TB epidemics and eliminating HPV and HCV infections by 2030. All goals contained with the Sustainable Development Goal 3.3. In addition, the network and the initiative itself is a framework for data-driven, equity-based implementation that leaves no one behind ensuring that we are able to gain access for all women, men, and children living with and affected by these diseases to the very best testing, prevention, treatment, care, and support services possible. As important, Fast Track Cities is a set of metrics of success with a mechanism for data transparency, because ultimately our progress or their lack thereof should be in the public domain so that affected communities can hold us responsible. In addition, Fast Track Cities provide a technical package for implementation, engagement, m and &E, and communication that is second to none. It all starts with the Paris Declaration, which is now in its third iteration. The Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities ending the HIV epidemic is based initially on the attainment of the 90-90-90 targets as set forth by UNAIDS. 90% of people living with HIV knowing their diagnosis 90% of people living with HIV AIDS who know their diagnosis on antiretroviral therapy, and 90% of those people on antiretroviral therapy achieving viral suppression, through which we can not only guarantee a near normal lifespan for people living with HIV, but we can also guarantee where we have viral suppression achieved, the lack of transmission of HIV within serodiscordant couples. As I already noted though, 90-90-90 is a starting point, and so we encourage fast-track cities and municipalities to expand their horizons and look to getting to zero new HIV infections, zero AIDS-related deaths, and as noted, zero stigma. And to that extent, the Paris Declaration 3.0 firmly embraces U equals U, or undetectable equals untransmittable. It embraces the meaningful involvement of people living with AIDS and the global involvement of people living with AIDS. Both of these two Declaration is important because they empower communities to lead the urban HIV response. As important, the Paris Declaration 3.0 firmly embraces primary prevention as well as biomedical prevention to include pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Paris Declaration 3.0 looks beyond HIV specifically to syndemic conditions, including mental health and substance use, which can present barriers to optimized patient outcomes amongst patients with mental health conditions or substance use disorders. As important and as a result of our success with antiretroviral therapy, the Paris Declaration 3.0 speaks to the need to address the longer term needs of people who are aging with HIV, a larger and larger cohort of patients as we move forward through this epidemic. We embrace the TB 90-90-90 targets to get to an end of that epidemic and as previously mentioned, we embrace 
the elimination of HPV and HCV, and in particular in relation to HCV, because of the fact we have a cure, and the fact more people are not cured of HCV today is a public health crisis. Our calculus for success is somewhat complicated, but not foreign to you in Japan. It includes the need for political will and commitment, not just from mayors and parliamentarians, but from citizens themselves. We are each of us, politicians in our own right, able to influence policies and the allocation of resources for priorities within our respective communities. It speaks to community engagement, Again, the meaningful involvement of people living with AIDS, but also the right to the city principles enshrined in the new urban agenda, which speaks to the fact that we each have a responsibility to design and influence the city in which we wish to live so that we have a decent standard of living. We embrace public health leadership within the calculus for success because public health departments are crucial to ensuring that we can, through technical handshakes, deliver the accountability that affected communities are due, including through the transparent use of data to guide data-driven equity-based planning. We promote health system capacity building because even within countries that are considered gold standard, there are significant gaps across the HIV prevention and care continua that require addressing. Stigma and discrimination elimination is key because even 30 five plus years into the HIV epidemic, we continue to see stigma, including intersectional stigma, perpetrated in a variety of settings, including healthcare settings. We address the assessment of quality of care and quality of life as part of a continuing quality improvement arc necessary to ensure that people living with and affected by HIV and AIDS are delivered the best quality care possible but they were also addressing the holistic needs of this population, including in relation to housing, food, education, and employment. And finally, the calculus for success depends greatly on the need for best practice sharing, because ultimately the success of a Japanese city can influence the success of a city in Mozambique, in Thailand, somewhere in Eastern Europe, as well as in the United States or in Latin America. I'd like to cite two examples of fast-track cities that have really influenced our thinking around urban HIV responses and demonstrated the effectiveness of the fast-track cities calculus for success. The first city is Bangkok. This is a city that joined the fast-track cities initiative in 2014. Here we demonstrate three years worth of trends in the, across 1990-1990 from 2016 through to 2018. What's important to note here is the 12 percentage point increase in the first 90 or the numbers of people who know their HIV status. That contributes directly to our ability to link people to antiretroviral therapy and here we see a 13 percentage point increase in the second 90 or the numbers of people who are on antiretroviral therapy. How is this done? The calculus for success, but key was community engagement and the ability to devolve the delivery of health and other services from clinical facilities to community-based facilities. In relation to the state of Victoria and specifically Melbourne, this is a state and a city that in many respects, I believe parallels some of the cities in Japan, including Tokyo, in relation to their 1990 data. We witnessed within a short period of time from signing the Paris Declaration in 2015 to 2017, a six percentage point increase in the second 90. Again, the numbers of people on antiretroviral therapy and a four percentage point increase in the third 90 or viral suppression, landing them at 96% as far as that third 90. To me, the third 90 is one of those critical targets in that, as already addressed, if we can sustain viral suppression amongst people living with HIV, not only can we guarantee them a near normal lifespan, but we can end the transmission of HIV amongst discordant couples. Turning to Japan specifically, Japan has been a world leader in relation to HIV 
inclusive of significant foreign assistance that is provided by the Japanese people to people outside of your borders in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the rest of South Southeast Asia, in other parts of the world that have benefited from your largesse. But it bears noting that in relation to the country's own HIV response, there are some challenges that we face, including the limited data on key HIV indicators. For example, no UNA spectrum reporting has been produced since 2016. So we work off of estimates, including the two cited publications I note in this slide. Additionally, although Japan is a low burden country with good ART adherence and excellent retention and care, efforts are still needed to attain and surpass the 90-90-90 targets. Your estimates are that 86% of people living with HIV know their status, 83% of people living with HIV AIDS who know their status are on antiretroviral therapy, and 99% of people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy are virally suppressed. While we can all agree these numbers are stellar and a model for the rest of the world to replicate, ultimately getting to zero requires that we close the gaps across these 390s. Additionally, we're aware of late HIV diagnosis, which has an impact on AIDS-defining illnesses. In fact, the latest data indicate that 29% of people diagnosed with HIV in Japan had developed AIDS. If we are able to launch the types of HIV screening and testing campaigns that are necessary to get at the harder to reach populations within Japanese society, we could close that gap significantly. It bears noting that the rate of late HIV diagnoses in Japan is higher than in other countries in the region, including Australia and New Zealand, but lower than Thailand. And of course, it also bears noting that foreign residents represent increasing proportions of newly diagnosed HIV and AIDS cases in Japan, which require types, the types of interventions that other countries and as important cities and municipalities have implemented to address these populations of vulnerable people. I'd like to speak now about the idea or concept of city multilateralism because in the traditional public health sense, nation states have been responsible for health diplomacy. However, it's become clear to us, particularly in relation to COVID-19, that urban leadership is required, particularly where nations fail to lead. So in Japan, we believe that urban leadership on HIV could really make an impact on the national HIV epidemic, allowing for your country not only to control its HIV epidemic, but go beyond that in the near future. But cities have various challenges and successes to share. If we look at Tokyo, for example, Tokyo has the highest number of HIV cases in all of Japan, but the best proportion of people who know their HIV status. This is a lesson learned, particularly the, the success story, that can be shared with cities such as Osaka and Yokohama, but as important, other cities within the Asia Pacific region, because it's my firm belief that a rising tide can lift all boats. Additionally, I believe there's a place for Japan to apply the city multilateralism concept. As I noted, diplomacy and action at the local level is now being utilized to coordinate with global peers on transnational concerns, including health. Cities and municipalities are learning from each other lessons in relation to how to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 itself, but also the effects of COVID-19 on the HIV response. Urban initiatives are also striving to make progress towards global goals and targets, including the Sustainable Development Goals, the New Urban Agenda, and other types of compacts such as climate change, where cities have taken a tremendous lead. There's also within the context of city multilateralism an opportunity for coordination with national governments and global movements, including around pandemic preparedness. It is clear that our world was not prepared for COVID-19 and neither were the cities and municipalities. And so in that sense, there is a tremendous amount of learning that we will be doing over the next couple of years that should inform 
pandemic preparedness at urban level, at national level, and at global level. I want to stress that city multilateralism is in addition to and not a replacement for national health diplomacy. And so we urge national governments not to view this concept as competitive, but in fact to view it as complementary to our efforts to ensure that our citizens achieve the highest level of health and well being. And finally, city multilateralism, I believe, could have a great effect in harm mitigation when nations fail to lead. Again, I cite COVID-19. It is very clear without my enumerating the countries that some countries have led and some countries have failed. And in that sense, we have seen not only a price paid in lives, but also a cost paid in treasure. In conclusion, I'd like to note that despite a longstanding commitment to end HIV around the globe, through the largesse of the Japanese people and your support of peoples around the world, Japan is not yet on track to attain and surpass the 90-90-90 targets and achieve Sustainable Development Goal 3.3 by 2030. So fast track cities could represent an important link to local communities of learning around the world and to tools aimed at ending urban HIV epidemics that leverage the lessons learned across a global network of more than 300 cities and municipalities. As important through city multilateralism, it is my firm belief that Japan's fast track cities, when they sign on, can be viewed as leaders in an urban health movement to end HIV at municipal, national, and global levels. I wish you a productive conference and I look forward to welcoming as many cities as possible from Japan to the Fast Track Cities Network. Thank you very much.